Welcome back. This module six lecture covers three topics, all of which are related to A-B testing of user content. First, I'll describe what I mean by user content. Second, I'll explore how non-traditional publishers measure the performance of their content. And third, I'll explain the basics of A-B content testing. I'm bringing this information to you now because you're starting your own A-B testing project in the course. We'll start with the description of user content. To begin, I suppose I should make it clear what type of organizations publish content today. It's important for you to understand there are two categories of publishers for which techcom professionals and others work. Traditional publishers include newspapers, book or periodical publishers, but by far, the majority of people in our profession work for non-traditional publishers. Examples would include software companies like Atlassian, where tech writers traditionally worked on paper documentation to accompany products, but now they put almost all of that content online. Non-traditional publishers also include engineering firms like Floor, where tech writers now create case studies for posting on a website instead of for print brochures. The last example here is meant to signal that non-technical companies like NFL football teams also publish their own web content. Sarah Kessler said it well back in 2014 in a Fast Company article. Thanks to the internet, anyone can now be a publisher. The fact that nearly all of this content publishing happens on the web through a digital device means the audience for all that content is appropriately referred to as users. Describing what counts as user content is something that people who create content for a living probably understand better than most, but even these folks sometimes fail to grasp all the types of content their organization creates, if it's not the type they create themselves. Let me give you a typical content type list from Kevin P. Nichols, who's the author of a book titled Enterprise Content Strategy. You ready? annual reports, biographies, calendar or event listings, contact information, email, fax, FAQs in other words, forms, images, glossaries, infographics, instructions, legal disclaimers, maps, news items, blog posts, podcasts, press releases, product details, support or help content, user guides, user generated content, tutorials, videos, and white papers. Whew, that's a lot of content. Based on a 2019 article from HostGator, I've listed the most common types of web pages on organizational websites on the left. To get a better handle on common types of content, we're going to look at two examples. We'll start at IKEA's homepage. From here, we can go to their products page and find categories of products like beds, There'll usually be a link in the footer of every page to information about the company. If we visit that page for IKEA, we'll see there are lots of individual topics at IKEA. A smaller organization might have a single page with information about the company. Typically, this is where there's some company history. There's also some way to contact the organization. At IKEA, that's through customer support. Notice there are several categories within customer support. There are many other types of pages possible. Here we have a careers page with information about getting a job and working for IKEA. Now I'm showing a different type of page that you might not find by starting at the IKEA homepage. The reason I found it is because I got an email from the company with an offer. There's a link in the offer email. When I click it, I'm taken to a specially designed page that's just about that offer. That's what's called a landing page. These are some of the most commonly A-B tested pages on an organization's website. They're explicit forms of advertising. Now let's look at a different type of site to see what kind of pages it includes. I'm going to click on a link in Twitter that shows an article that's got an interesting title to me. So it takes me not to a landing page, but to the article itself inside what is an e-zine called Content Science Review. 
Notice I get a pop-up requesting that I sign up for regular email updates. It's a way of getting me to be more engaged with the organization. It's a mini conversion. More about that later. This e-zine is different from IKEA in terms of page types, largely because it is an e-zine. We can visit a list of topics. If we go to the footer, we see how to advertise on the e-zine. The footer also includes policies, for instance, on sharing or republishing. I didn't point that out on IKEA's site, although they also have pages with policies and other legal information. Note that if I click on the Sponsors link, Content Science, now I get to an organizational website. It's more similar to IKEA's. This is a company that sells services instead of products. From their home page, I can view the About page, Clients, Capabilities, Products, Publications. So let me summarize the main points I want to make here. Nearly every organizational website will include four types of pages. Home, Products or Services, About Us, and Contact. Those are like the bare bones pages. Many organizational sites, especially in larger organizations, will also include landing pages connected to advertising campaigns. And they're likely to have some others too, for example, careers or news or publications. Before we move on, it's probably a good idea to talk a little about user content in terms of something called the sales or conversion funnel. The instructional materials from Kissmetric and HubSpot in Module 6 mention measuring as far down the funnel as possible. They're talking about this funnel shown on the slide. In other words, what they mean is the ideal A-B testing from a marketing perspective measures purchases. You might call them sales. That's the ultimate measure of whether content works. I'll talk about this more in the next part of the lecture. What I want to highlight now is that traditionally, TechCom pros created content that's delivered at the bottom of the funnel after a buyer makes a purchase. That's when they need, for example, an installation guide for the company's software product. However, in order to get prospective buyers to enter the top of the funnel, companies need prospective customers to be aware of their product. That's why they produce advertising content. The creators of that content are usually in a marketing unit within the company. In the past, TechCom and Marcom writers rarely interacted. But way back in 2014, Scott Abel, also known as the Content Wrangler, gave a presentation called The Future of Technical Communication is Marketing. He made a convincing case that customers are not well served by the separation of content creation within a company. Abel said, once a prospect buys a product or service, the content they interact with is no longer familiar. The instructions provided don't look, feel, or sound anything like the marketing and sales materials that introduce them to your brand. Neither does the service contract, the warranty, the customer support website, the product documentation, or the training materials. So this is where user experience or UX comes in because there's a less clear separation based on where the user is in the conversion funnel. The point is that users need content at all stages of the buyer journey. Now that we have a shared understanding of what types of content organizations publish on the web, I want to help you think about how an organization decides whether that content is performing as they intended. I'm going to start with this graphic, which is based on information in a chapter on content ROI, that's return on investment, in a book titled Content Strategy by Rahel Ann Bailey and Nas Urbana. The graphic shows that ultimately publishing content, like everything else done by an organization, is only valuable if it makes an organization more profitable. That can be done by making more or spending less money. That's important for any organization, whether their motive is more profit to keep for themselves as a for-profit business or more profit to add to what they can provide to others as a non-profit. The outcomes on the right are the ways content can influence the bottom line. Building brand loyalty and increasing revenue lead to more money. 
Managing risk and increasing efficiency lead to lower expenses. Changes in the scope of work can influence either revenue or expenses. The point here is that to understand the performance of content, you can't avoid talking about the ultimate bottom line, money. For web content, the page is usually the unit of interest. So of course, quantitative page content performance is measuring what happens on a web page by counting, using numbers. Marketing professionals talk about three performance measures of web content. Reach, which could be measured by counting the number of times someone visits a page. Engagement, which could be measured by counting the minutes spent on a page or the rate at which people immediately click out of the page once they arrive. That's bounce rate. The most important content performance measure for marketing in particular is conversion. The big one is counting the number of times someone buys an item. But you can count some other actions like the number of times an item is added to a shopping cart or even the number of times someone chats with customer support as a type of conversion. For user experience or design professionals like Jan Cardello at Nielsen Norman Group, there are other actions to count to gauge page performance. In a 2014 article, Cardello called these micro-conversions, like counting the number of people who subscribe to a regular email update or who download a white paper. Her boss, Jacob Nielsen, reminded us that most organizations are better served by looking at both short-term, that's conversion, and long-term, that's micro-conversion, measures of performance. Qualitative page content performance is measuring what happens on a web page by describing it in words rather than numbers. When it comes to web page performance, user experience professionals categorize measures into two types. Behaviors, which could describe, for example, the actions a user takes while on a page. That might mean keystrokes or where on the page their eyes focus. And the other type is attitudes which could describe how users feel after visiting a page or, or what they say they intend to do after visiting a page or how satisfied they are with their experience while completing some action. While marketing professionals also use qualitative performance measures, they're usually more focused on quantitative measures. Techcom and UX professionals are often more interested in qualitative measures. Carol Ong and Mario Vandermeulen published an article in 2019 titled Design Research versus Market Research. It's helpful in understanding the kinds of content research done in these two different business areas. I've adapted one of the figures from their article on this slide. Organizations conduct both marketing and design research to answer questions about users or customers. Both of them may collect qualitative and quantitative data. The difference according to these authors is, simply put, market research goes wide to understand who and what, design research goes deep to get clarity on why and how. If you've done any UX work or taken any UX courses, many of these research methods should be familiar to you. You'll see that A-B testing is listed here. It is most commonly used in marketing, specifically advertising research. That brings us to part three of the lecture where I'll explain the basics of conducting an A-B content test. There's far more to conducting research than I'm going to cover here. The overall process for A-B content testing requires four steps. First step, you create two versions of your content. What varies and how much the two versions vary from each other is dependent on your goals. The upside to testing a single element of your page, whether that's the voice of copy or a graphic or the placement of a button, is that that element is tied directly to any difference you find in user behavior or attitudes. The downside to testing a single element is that you may have several elements you'd really like to test. If you vary more than one element and find differences in user behavior, however, you won't know which specific element made a difference. In this course, I've removed the choice. You're supposed to test only the voice of copy in your project. 
The standard and A-B testing done by marketing pros is to actually create live versions of the same landing page or an email for testing. This is called high fidelity content because both versions are in their published form. Sometimes it makes more sense to test low fidelity or lo-fi versions. This is similar to UX design practice with wireframes and prototypes. The page you're seeing on the slide represents a lower five version of a web page, but it could be even lower if it was all sketching. In other words, the text was represented by a line rather than by actual characters that spell out lorem ipsum text. You should choose the fidelity of the content you test in your course project based on two things. First, what would you like to show in a portfolio to potential employers? Second, how much time do you have to devote to web page design? Your answers will differ depending on your current expertise and your ultimate career goals, and that's fine with me. The second step in A-B content testing requires that you choose the performance variables you're going to test. So think back to the quantitative and qualitative measures I mentioned in part two of the lecture. For your course project, you certainly won't measure page views because you're testing copy on a single page, but you should think about what you might count and whether there's any point to it with such a small group of users. For instance, is it worth capturing how long a user looks at your content? If you want to get a measure of user engagement, would it be more valuable to ask a survey question about how likely the user would be to read the content on the page? There are many choices to make. You won't make the same choices for every A-B test. The best choices are those that allow you to learn something valuable about what to do with your content to improve its performance. The third step is creating the materials you'll use and administering them to users. You'll need to recruit participants who are as much like your actual users as possible. Ideally, you split your users randomly between the two versions you're testing. Before you can actually administer the test, you have to set up your tools or materials for collecting performance data. Whether users are coming to your lab or doing the test online, you'll need to set up the right materials and software. If you're using survey type questions to measure user attitudes, you'll need a way to collect their answers. While you can use paper and pencil forms if your users are visiting you, there are many tools available that automate data collection and allow you to download a spreadsheet with results after your users are finished. Google Forms is an awesome free tool I recommend to you for your course project. The final step in A-B content testing requires that you use your test results to make content recommendations. Summarizing and analyzing the data you've collected is much easier if you've used an automated tool. Google Forms gives you your results in Google Sheets. You can download Sheets into Excel if you're more comfortable with Microsoft programs. Ultimately, you'll need to present your insights and recommendations to decision makers. I'll talk about that in the Module 7 video lecture. Have a great week.